for me to be here and participate. My name is Andres Coitinho. I'm a relationship in international relations with a Master of Global Health Policy. I've been working with this, uh, in this agenda in the last seven years since I arrived after my experience of study and work in other organizations in the Ministry of Health, and I got involved in trying to build an agenda with the topics involving my experience in international relations and strengthening the work of the Ministry in that area. I, it was possible for me to be the Director of International Relations during four years and in the Pan-American Health Organization to this date, especially working in programs for the strengthening of South House cooperation and in products that we have worked together and in, in some other initiatives, training initiatives, having as a focus international relations and thoughts involving the programs that this program is working in diplomacy of health. This is um, a short presentation and the format of this class of 30, 40 minutes, in which we may present some central elements on module two, which is governance in health. And this first class, we are going to discuss on several players in the United Nations system, creating a liaison between global governance, governance health governance and health Global governance and health governance, sorry. The role of the WHO, of PAHO, as diplomacy forums in health and diplomacy of health and coordinators of the health in the United Nations Area, especially the WHO, we'll see the role of different UN players in health, their development and their interests in the work of several agencies in health to, and we will try to polemize and have some discussion on how regional integration mechanisms, in this case, UNASUR, have a role to play in this new governance architecture in global health. Of course, any consultation, any question you may ask, please include it and, and do it. And this is the right exchange a space between the uh, um, teacher and the participants in these classes. This is more or less the content of the session. Initial idea, governance of global health. So we're going to start with it. Trying to see the framework of this WHO, PAHO, and United Nations role in governance of global health. You will see more of this by Paolo in the class in module three. But it is important to understand the role of the organizations in this framework. When we refer to organizations and processes through which the society defines and interpret share values, challenges, responsibilities in the area of human health. From the inception of the United Nations in 46 until the early 90s, when we referred to global governance, we were imagining 
the system of the United Nations and the government and uh, steering bodies, schemes. The UN is uh, leading global governance in the area of health, although there is a series of discussions and elements that will Uh, through which we see the appearance of govern, global governance and the concept of global governance. This idea, we have the multiplicity of players, especially in the area of global health, opening to broader visions of the relevance of other United Nations forums that are becoming more and more important in health issues, changes in power relationships, and the use of the academy of concepts on governance. You will, you will see this in some documents of PNUG, trying to discuss what good governance is accountability in different contexts in the 90s. These elements had a very serious discussions on control, rendering of account, and the efficiency of expenditure. After the year 2000, this concept of global governance will show that there are multiple sectors and levels, more political forums, more central forums, a global architecture of health, which is broader. You may see in this slide some authors have analyzed how global governance in health is being used. And they see there are three cases that are more used. This is a work by Kelly Lee, developing the idea that governance, and one of the meanings is governance for global health, in national regional levels that support the global agenda. And we may see the discussions and mechanisms of foreign affairs, regional and sub-regional spaces. And then we had governance of global health, and we have the governance of the organizations and their connections, the scheme WHO, steering bodies and agencies, and finally, global governance for health, which is the context of, uh, of global organizations interacting uh, in the area of health. And the area of health benefits from this because we have here the relevance of the social determinants of health and how we can think in these global elements interacting with which it is important to create regulations, political dialogues, dialogue program, policies, and so on, and including other sectors. Just to close this framework, because this is the first class of global governance, there is, when we refer to this new series of players, we refer to an emergency of authors and public private alliances and a new configuration of international trade. You see here in this scheme, uh, 
which is a UNTA scheme and has a very funny, funny name, the spaghetti bowl, to be able to represent the current scenery of trade relationships, especially in the new sub-regional groups involved in trade and free trade. This spaghetti ball, this world of players, as you see, make a completely different scenario. In this new configuration, we are going to discuss the topic of United Nations and how uh, the topic has been included in the agenda of the United Nations. There is a growing interface with the trade organization and a new manner of configuration of the debate of health issues at the political level. In groups such as uh, G7, G20, and different non-aligned movements. There are different groups discussing on global health with and that have a meaning because of the weight of the parties. This is an example and this proves um, how the topic has been included in the agenda of these important groups. It will continue to be there in order to take into consideration the new configuration. Something that is interesting to see in the light of these new configurations and to think about the role of the multilateral system, we have to analyze and have a look at the official support to development that you may be able to see in the Anglo-Saxon literature, Development Assistant for Health. And how this support, this assistant, is behaving in the last years. It is good to work on large numbers. How much is the official assistant to health today? We are seeing that 2015 figures, they refer to 36.4 billion. And 2016, that do not appear in the, on this slide, but the figures from the Washington University developing this product of analysis, which is the funding for health and the, the global burning of disease. These tools were, are very useful in order to have a very um, specific picture of health. That means to say, in 2016, $36.7 billion that are used annually in the cooperation for health, for the health sector. You will see that in this assessment, there is a marked characteristic since the year 2000 to 2010, where the cooperation for health grew 11.4% each year on average during the golden age of global health financing. And this is associated to the large programs uh, for AIDS, also against HIV, malaria, and different configurations 
that were being proposed and their financing or funding mechanisms. Between 2010 and 2015, we have a slower stage, probably linked to the impacts of the financial crisis in 2008, and has to do also with a question involving changes in agenda priorities and the themes addressed and limits involving how much can be in invested in more vertical programs. Just to give you an idea, because perhaps this may lead to confusions, this is a global figure and the estimate for Latin America is more or less 10% of these figures. Uh, that means to say the cooperation that Latin America receives in classic terms. Because you've been able to see the character, the alternative visions and the classic. In a classic visions, donor, receiver, 10% is what Latin America receives. It is important to see the sectors and the areas financed by global health. The success that we may have with programs depends on this. And here I th start thinking on some relevant items. Uh, the steering bodies of PAHA, of WHO, of the United Nations, we have to bear in mind the, the need of having funds to impl for implementing the programs and the strategy and the action plans that we have. We see that mm, in these steering bodies, they create new plans. And when we see the budget of these new plans, they can only sustain two people in charge of the program for the region for two years. That means to say, we start to think that the elements, the funding elements, and how we are going to fund these programs is a fundamental question. Here you have an evolution on the growth. Comparing in green the golden age of funding in health and 2010, 2015 as a second stage. There is a point here that a stronger growth rate, the investment, especially on AIDS, we are in the first years of the 21st century, which was reduced in other topics. However, you see two interesting elements. Beyond, this is the lack of acceleration since 2010, for example, TB is one of the global concerns involving multi-resistance and uh, the multiplication and growth of cases. We will have a global conference in Russia in November this year. And next year, a special section in the United Nations on TB is expected. You see, in the last five years, the evolution of global cooperation in health hasn't changed. It's, it doesn't cover the inflation costs. And you may see that the way we speak to SWAPs is the integral programs with a system approach. 
This is the approach, the horizontal approach. Although in the rest of investment, there is also a change towards horizontal implementation. There is an important question that I would like you to highlight in all these funding dynamics in health, which is the role of the NGO and foundations. You will see here in this graph a diagram of flows. Uh, this is a Sankei diagram. is a technical name presenting the sources, channels, and destinations of the money. And you may see on the left the sources you see the channels in the middle through which it is financed and in destinations we see the areas child health aids malaria and so on we were speaking about the bone of the aids era and we see that in fact is the area with most funding with the highest funding Perhaps child health and AIDS may be the higher, highest ones. Here again, you see this topic of swaps. But you see here the role of NGOs. They are having a very important role in, the, in channeling these projects. It depends, and the type of channeling depends, because sometimes we have funding mechanisms. For example, there are some formats, new formats, which are the notes. When the funding source uses a global NGO, and this work is disseminated in several countries. You see some NGOs having, for example, their bases in Africa, and here the foundations and NGOs uh, become a very important channel. Mm, they receive money from the United States and private philanthropists. To see the comparison of values, we see the amount channeled by the United Nations, 12.4% in 2016. $12 billion, more or less which is channeled through the United Nations. Just to give you an idea, and to close this topic of funding, which, of course, can be discussed for a long time, and you are invited to exchange ideas in the forum on this. I was telling you that United Nations, more or less 12 percent, 12 billion dollars. But there is also a reduction of 12 percent. There is a reduction from one year to the other, which is explained by the force in 2014 re regarding the fight against Ebola. Ebola in 2014. And other elements that I wanted to address. We spoke of the foundations and the growing role they have. The Bill Gates Foundation is the foundation that has more participations in these philanthropy actions. 
the United States, the United States, uh, the source that more cooperates in health. And we have the growing role of the World Bank and financial institutions. And we can include here the Inter-American Development Bank. There is a strong increase in the last three years of funding from the World Bank for health projects. The highest increment we have in 2014-2015 with the World Bank investing 62% more in health programs. This is important in the light of how the system is articulated. The United system is articulated in order to become more efficient, of course. This was the element of how this funding is distributed. Now we are going to see PAHO and WHO. We could say this. The United Nations system channels the efforts. Why is it that WHO and PAHO are so important? Because in addition to this new scheme of cooperation in health, WHO is the center of global governance. For many reasons. In the first place, it has a authority and a steering duty that was uh, given by the consensus of all the state in order to coordinate the health system within the United Nations. The purpose of all this in order to close this central idea is the coordinator and secondly continues to be the main governance forum and articulation space and even more WHO and its forums and the World Health Assembly has the ability to have international rules based on international law. So, for example, the tobacco control agreement the code for the replacement of milk, the international health regulation. There are a series, therefore, of international law tools that the WHO and governance have. And for that reason, it is so important. I mean to say the direction and coordination of the system and the capacity to build through diplomacy of health instruments and tools of higher legal value. This you will see more with Daisy according to what I see in the program. The, the, the part of diplomacy and international law. I just wanted to mention the six basic functions of the WHO which are defined in the 11th working program, the beginning of the year 2000. And they are the best ones. And one to describe them is to offer leadership in crucial topics in health and participate in alliances. There is a change of the scheme of the role of the WHO building and strengthening alliances, partnerships in health. There is a vision, therefore, with the scheme of new players that has to include the states and the WHO as a central coordinator. There is an evolution here of the role 
is a role that we won't find in the Constitution, in the by 48 bylaws. Second, to determine the research lines stimulating the production of knowledge, valuable knowledge, as well as the translation and dissemination of the information material. Then we have to have norms and standards, and fourth, to formulate options of policies with ethical and scientific basis to provide technical support and to continue um, um, monitoring the situation in the area of health, determining the health trends. These are the basic functions of the WHO. It is important An element, a fundamental element is a phrase that you have to remember. The purpose of the organizations and what we do here is to achieve for all the countries the highest possible health level. This is very broad a definition, of course. But this definition contains us all in which globally there is an agreement that the 194 member states of the WHO When we ratify the Constitution, we all agree this, on this purpose and this mandate. I always recall a colleague, Juan Garay, that said that the moment to assess the work of the organization is the only measure is if we were able to achieve the highest health degree for all the peoples of the world. I always re remember this uh, idea. Just to advance in the characterization of the WHO, the work of the organization is carried out by a central directed work, first of all, we would like to mention the organs of the organizations. There are some steering organs, which are the highest organs in organizations. Uh, first of all, the World Health Assembly that gathers in the month of May every year in Geneva, unless there is a, another venue. But in, just for logistic uh, facilities, Geneva has been the venue of these assemblies. Um, more or less 2,000 delegates gather during two weeks, sometimes two and a half weeks. The scheme has changed lately, and they are, the meetings now are longer. But the World Health Assembly is the top organ defining the policies, mandates, plan strategies, and also the director general. It appoints a director general. Then we have an executive council supporting the work. And they gather twice a year. And we have two auxiliary organs. There is a secretariat also, which, is, uh, which has a director general as the head chief. We have Tedros, the new director general, 
who he was a uh, former minister of health and worked in Malavia, and he was elected on the 1st of June as in replacement of Dr. Chan. It is important to mention here in this slide the organization has 8,000 professionals, technical administrative staff distributed in the uh, central office in Geneva and five regional offices that you see on the map and 47 country offices. You have AMRO in the Americas, AFRO in Africa, EMRO, Mediterranean, EURO, the European region, CEARO, which is the southeast of Asia, and WICRO, which is in charge of the Pacific, East Pacific area. There are different characteristics. When I refer to AMRO, the Americas region is AMRO, A-M-R-O. We many times mention the PAHO, but we will speak later about PAHO. But it is important to know that not all the regions have a PAHO and not all the regions have a similar scheme, a work scheme. The World Health Assembly is the supreme organ of the WHO. They meet in Geneva, 194 members. They have to determine the policies of the organizations. They appoint the director general, supervision of financial policies, and they approve programs, budgets, and the working plan. They also examine all the results of the Executive Council, for example, the reports on the implementation of the plans and the progress of the plans. I would like to mention now uh, uh, about the work, the dynamics of the work of the Assembly. I would like to see this in the forum, exchange experiences of colleagues that have been able to participate uh, in the assembly. More or less 3,000 delegates. So this is a world of people, players, delegations, uh, small delegations, large delegations. You will find in the corridors the players of the organization, non-state organizations, the number of uh, companies wishing to fund uh, a product, then, uh, but probably you will find them, uh, as I said, in the corridors. You, you will see three large spaces, the plenary with the main topic, business, as usual, we have a plenary we have, with a central topic. The minister speak and discuss on the topic. Perhaps there may be some invitees. The plenary has the force in the first two and a half days, and then they consider this to approve the topics delivered by the commission. They discuss the programmatic elements. The Commission B is centered on administrative topics and perhaps some management topics. Sometimes they exchange also ideas. There are reaction groups. There are things negotiated also beforehand. There are negotiations that haven't been finished continue until the very last moments 
at the very last moment, it means two or three in the morning, discussions at two or three in the morning. On weekends, So there are long negotiations, and the reaction groups have a fundamental weight in a coordination when we have small delegations to be able to comply with the participation of the region. What about UNASUR in the assembly? The idea of this course is to have a sub-regional approach. This is a recommendation. There is a very good work that three colleagues in the region of the region. There is a very good work that we will share in the list of bibliography, which is a document on the positions of UNASUR in the World Health Assembly. You will see the richness of the process from the moments in, uh, in 2010, 2011, after the creation of the Council, is leading the discussions and the position of the UNASO on questions of medicine, which is the strong topic in terms of bilateral negotiation. And we see the great work of our colleagues and the political support of the ministers, but in 20, since 2010, there is a long wave of common positions, good and bad ones. And it's good to see that bibliography, as I said, and see the role of UNESCO in their common positions in the different spaces, not only in the assembly, but I suggest you have a look and think about these ideas. What about the Executive Council now? The Council is made up of 35 members. These members are qualified technically, and they are appointed for a three-year man mandate And you have two ordinary meetings in January and May. In the third week of January, you have the meeting. And then there is a shorter one in, in May, in Geneva. Perhaps the second one uh, deals with administrative topics. The January meeting is very, very important. Basically, it's a preparation of the assembly. It is fundamental to have the presence of all the members of the Executive Council. The main duties of the Council are to enforce the decisions of the Assembly and provide advice to the Assembly. When we refer that there are 34 members that are technically qualified, in fact, the members are not the states, but the state appoints a person that will be the member, the counselor of, of the WHO. This is very different from the format of the assembly. Yes, when we attend the assembly, we have credentials, but we, when we speak, we speak for the country. But the representative in the council, uh, in the council is the person. In the assembly, is the country. I would like to point out who are the UNASUR members that are part of the country. We have Brazil from 2017, from 2020, Colombia 2016, 2019. 
these are the two members. The South American regions has been able to maintain two members in the council throughout time. There were three. We had Argentina, Brazil, and Suriname as the highest number of members of the council. It's a good, it's a good average having two members of the council. So there are two spaces, and it's fundamental. The agreements of membership of the Executive Council are made at the regional level. Uh, in this case, AMRO or PAHO. They vote the members of the Americas for the Executive Council. Other mechanisms that we may see, other mechanism that we are going to see now, the PBAC, which is the administration and budget topics with 14 members, which are members of the Executive Council in addition to the President and one of the vice presidents of the council. There are four vice presidents. All the drafting of the general working program are made by the PBCI. There is another comp. In PIVAC, there are two members of the Americas, which are Mexico and the Dominican Republic. The Supervision Advising Committee is in charge of financial statements and external auditing. But there are other intergovernmental processes. In this case, in the last years, there have been a trend to provide more incidents as seen in certain drafts. So the trend has resulted in the creation of different open negotiation further forums on the to on several topics. The CEWG is the open meeting of member states with experts in development and for funding of research. Other examples are the governance amendment and also open-ended groups and the spaces of negotiations. These are open to member states that meet twice a year generally and they work on the drafts. These are negotiation spaces because the documents are the proposal of plans when they are very uh, sensible for the state. Uh, the consultations before were minimal. So many times the representation have different connections. And in fact, the Ministry of Health had been involved in the representation on several topics. But as the drafts were sent and the nonconformity of the states uh, when there were no discussions, and so this created new space for discussions. And here we have a concrete point. 
the role of the representations of member states in the United Nations in Geneva. This is a fundamental role. If there is a connection with the representation, I suggest to send a mail to have a meeting of the minister or vice minister with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in order to strengthen the work of the coordination with Geneva. Because they will have the dialogue and the informal consultations. These informal consultations are fundamental. You may say, well, but how is it that I get to know? Here you have the network of representations in Geneva, which is very important. There are several models on how to work on this in Geneva. Some countries have a health attaché. This is a new thing. The uh, United States has a uh, health uh, attaché since the 50s, but now there are more. It's a representative, a te technician in Geneva that only takes the WHO agenda and topics related to health. For example, the WIPO has a basis on Geneva. This is very helpful, and I know that in this course we have many colleagues from the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, and they love the idea of generality, so they prefer to have diplomats that are managing all the topics. So one day they go to Geneva on health, and then they go to another uh, entity on another topic. To my point of view, the level of detail of these topics requires a management, a diplomatic management, that it would be important to think in specificity of qualification of these technicians. By the diplomacy academies and to create a working cycle among these missions between the uh, a work that is uh, consistent between the PAHO and the venue. And this is my call also to my colleagues in foreign affairs. The priorities and basis and structure, the 12th general working program 2014-2019 is the head of everything that we do at the WHO. There are three large chapters. One is related to governance and management. The other one is the WHO leadership, the multiplicity of player is the WHO leadership is very, very important. And then we have the result change with six categories on which the budgets and medium-sized programs are built. In May, the 2018-2019 uh, program was approved. The programs have to do with aligning with the development goals sustainable development goals, and the program of emergencies through the increase of funding and for the emergency program and for the other important area, which is antimicrobial resistance. These programs grow very much in budgeting terms. And this is included in the result change of the program. This is something that we that you should also pay attention is the reform process of the WHO. Everything that we mentioned at the beginning 
philanthropies, incidents of new actual partnerships. All this caught the, uh, the alarm of the organization of Secretary and Member States. So we need a reform process, funding, protecting the organization, balancing all these topics, and thinking about different questions. So there was a re program reform. With a, we have the programs that result change associated to in the relation to the strategic plan of PAHO, which is based on the general working plan of the WHO. Also, the reform of management and reform of governance. And here you have in the chart the non-state process reform, the topics within the WHO strengthening on changes in governance, time harmonization, improving times, accountability, and a series of elements that you may be able to explore later. Among them, we have non-state players. There is a new scheme of relationships with the non-state players with new cooperation frameworks with the academy, the private sector, philanthropists, and the NGOs. What about the capability of the PAHO and the WHO to develop partnerships with the non-state players? This promotes the working relationship of these two large entities with non-state players. When we want to have better relationships, because this is part of the reality of global health. We wish to, we wish to have transparency, accountability, clear questions. The state create this, and the best framework is this one. Monitoring tools, registration tools, well-conducted work, public reports, and control on the relationship of the uh, and all these um, bodies, who is who. This will lead to more and better relationship with more transparency and accountability. Uh, this is not true that FESA is cutting the wings of the Secretariat. No, this is not true, of course. Finally, the funding, this is how the WHO is financed with voluntary contributions. And what you see in yellow, the flexible funds and the contributions by countries. And perhaps any voluntary flexible contribution. It's very really difficult to have kind of voluntary contributions. All in the working plan, one of the great progress is having an integral budget. Today, budgets and the priorities of states are based on the global budget, and not only on the yellow one that you saw, that you see. So we may see the priorities from the governments of the budget, of the whole budget. This is a change in the last five years. Now we will see the PAHO. OK, we will address now the PAHO.
the Pan American Health Office, AMRO, we have heard many denominations. But in fact, I want to clarify the terms and ideas. The PAHO has many institutional ideas. The health organization is an international organization. They started to be a specialized office, specialized agent of health for the Inter American system. The Inter American organ that you know is the OAS. And after the creation of the WHO, there was an agreement. And um, therefore, the PAHO stretches to be the regional America's office. So it's an independent organization with the legal capacity. Within the Inter American system, it's a specialized agency with the specific name with the OAS. And it's also, according to specific agreement of the WHO, it also governs the America's health activities. The, we have several duties until we came to these agreements. The purpose of the organization is to promote and coordinate the efforts of countries of the Western Hemisphere to address and fight diseases, to prolong life and stimulate the physical and mental improvement of the inhabitants. Uh, we have the Pan American Health Conference, the Steering Council and Executive Council. They also have a subcommittee of program budget and administration, and the Pan American Health Office. The director of the Pan American Health Office, but we are also um, call her the PAHO director according to the Constitution. The PAHO is has headquarters in Washington and 27 country offices and specialized centers. 35 member states, three participant states, which are countries, these participant states, including territories in the region but that the foreign relations are delegated in a country outside the region. In the case of France, UK, and Holland. These are participant states, so they have right to vote in the steering council. So the 35 member states vote, and the three participant state. There are four associated members, non-independent territories. They are like observers. They don't vote. And there are two observing states, Portugal and Spain. The key instruments is the agenda of the America's health, which will be replaced this year by the sustainable health agenda for the Americas. This will be approved, considered in 2017 in September, in the next steering council meeting. We hope it is approved. There is a five-year plan, 2014-19, and 2018-19 um, budget and program. This is based uh, very much in the results change of the WHO, the race steering committee made up of nine members that meet twice a year. You have here the uh, meetings. In South America, we have Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Colombia. Uh, 
This executive council prepares the agenda similar to the WHO executive council. The recommendation is to understand the cycle of steering council. The topics of the agenda have a life cycle of at least one year because the agenda of the following steering council is now to be discussed in September. We will be discussing the agenda of the forthcoming steering council for the year 2018. The topics or the themes are built according to the relevance by reports, site events, parallel actions to the conference to choose the topic. The same in the, as the WHO, that means to say, to think about the topics, how to get players nearer. Another call of attention is the preparation of all these activities and coordinated with the representations before the OAS. There is not such a close dialogue with the OAS as with the WHO. Of course, of course with the WHO, the dialogue is closer for many reasons, of course. In order to continue, we have the United Nations systems. We have to think of health beyond the WHO or the PAHO. This is the sea of the United Nations. This is a world apart. The General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, and the Council of Human Rights. This is fundamental for human health, in addition to other programs and agencies. In the Assembly and the Health Council, we have to think about this. There is a growing place for health topics in the United Nations Forum. Generally in the General Assembly of the United Nations, and many times there is the third committee. The third committee meets during the General Assembly and is in charge of social, humanitarian, cultural topics. The Assembly begins in September You will see the, the, the um, addresses of the heads of state, but the assembly starts there and ends up in December, mid-December, just before Christmas. During those sessions, they work on a number of topics, and many of the health topics had been already discussed. We have the evolution since 2001 with the special sessions and high-level meetings. These high-level meetings and special sessions are parallel to the General Assembly. They take place in the United Nations, and they try to involve high-level personalities, and we have the uh, 2001 AIDS session and there was a declaration of commitment on AIDS, the funding process and political process of the golden decade of funding. We have non-communicable disease in 2011 that also uh, resulted in a political declaration which was fundamental um, gathering political partnerships and funding. And another example, a current example, uh, TB, the high-level meeting, the Russia is organization. A special session is approved for TB on the United Nations that will 
of course result in a declaration and a political prioritization on this theme. Uh, during the United Nations Assembly, the ECOSOC, and this is a very broad discussion, which is an organ of social representation and having its agenda on social, cultural, and economic topics. They gather in July every year, but it doesn't have the capacity of mandate. One of the strongest cycles for the health sector is the creation in ECOSOC of the program. He is going to repeat about the ECOSOC mandate because there was a sound problem. The ECOSOC mandate refers to social, economic, and cultural topics, but it is always discussed. The low power of ECOSOC. There are also in ECOSOC the participation of NGOs. Uh, and that means to say. Um, NGOs participate in the United Nations through the ECOSOC. But the World Bank, the WHO and ECOSOC are the three cousins of the... But it was important also for the creation of ONUSIDA with the fundamental roles and the Council of Human Rights. This is a quite a new forum that meets in Geneva. I won't go into detail because there are sessions related to rights that you will have on the course. And you will speak about human rights and health as a right, as a human right. The Council of Human Rights has created a specific rapporteur on health. The rapporteur informs on the right to health, and it's the space in which eval universal evaluations of each one of the countries are made. It has a specific denomination is the annual report of countries uh, where countries report their progress in human rights. The Council of Human Rights gives uh, the uh, comments or remarks, and they have to say how they will make these changes in order to comply with the right to health. According to the social, cultural, and economic regulations. The council is the supervisor of this scheme. Finally, about the United Nations coordination and the coherence that the United System tries to achieve. At the global level, there are several subgroups and interagency groups in order to, for example, the revision every few years of the structuring elements that coordinate the work of the system of United Nations at the regional level. We have regional teams, which is the group of the United Nations for Development. There are support groups. At the national level, we have the teams of the United Nations by countries that are United Nations coordination teams that I lead it by a resident coordinator in each one of the countries. 
This is important because this is an element to provide coherence to the United Nations systems. And it is important. The UNDA is the strategic program for the collective response of the United Nations vis-a-vis -vis the priorities of each country. This is important because Manut is discussed once every four years and involves the discussions of all the government. Many times, health is left outside, but it's important to be there because the United Nations will, will see the implementation of the framework agreements. And if it is outside, you will have less involvement, less tools to involve uh, the um, several topics in the discussions. For the policy makers of each country, it is important to have an eye on these meetings and the results. Also, another topic are some changes that are coming in the area of United Nations. There is a new secretary, Antonio Gutierrez. He's a Portuguese. He uh, was a former prime minister of Portugal. And also, he acted in the Refugees Agency. He's the new secretary general. And among his proposals of reform, uh, he tries to highlight the level of ruin city, we try to have more connection with the United Nations Secretariat and the interagency work. It's in the PNUD, and they try to move it to the General Secretariat. There are some agencies with fundamental roles in health. And this is just to, in the first instance, UNICEF promoting the rights of children everywhere. And they have programs related to ensuring healthy childhood until adolescence related to the health of the mothers and children and multi-sectoral programs also. UNICEF uh, played a role in the basic packets involving growth, vaccination, health, sanitary conditions. This is the basic package. Vis-a-vis -vis the idea of horizontal uh, health and health for us. Um, we still have some vaccination campaigns or a rehydration. The second fundamental role which is important to mention, is UNFPA, if the Fund of the United Nations for Populations, promoting the right of its citizens to have a healthy life, with a very important focus. This was created in 68, in 69, it's an agency. And the focus is on ensuring that uh, birth, pregnancy is the general scheme. That means to say that each pregnancy has to be a wish of the mother. And with safe births, and to comply with the possibilities of each person. Y 
UN AIDS, or ONUCIDA in Spanish, is a program which is built around 11 organizations of the United Nations. It's a joint program. It's not an agency. It's the only one in its type. It has a council of 22 member states, including countries of the region, Ecuador, Brazil, and Chile, three South American countries, which are in the Coordinated Council of UNAIDS. They also include the civil society, NGOs, an association of people that live with AIDS. UNAIDS was responsible at the beginning of the 2000s in order to process this funding bond and advance substantially in many of the questions of access to retroviral in the region together with other political elements and commercial elements. Other programs that I think are important to think about and their roles is the environment program, that deals with climate change and health, ILO with the regulation on labor diseases, unit aid, which is the access to medicines, uh, PNUD and FAHO, with things about the food codex, one health strategies, considering the phytosanitary and sanitary aspects and the international nutrition conferences. Just to come to a closure, regional integration in this context, some ideas to launch for the debate of the role of regional integration. It's important to continue developing the expertise in several fields, and this includes health diplomacy. In this course, we have people from the foreign affairs ministries. It is important to build capacities in health diplomacy. Second, the, import, the relevance of the coordination between health and foreign affairs. The working process for the meeting involving FAO were very important, and WHO. We are referring uh, to the nutrition conference. The ministries had a fundamental role balancing the weight of the agricultural and health. Perhaps there were uh, colliding interests on genetic products and so on. And here we, we see the relevance of a good relationship and understanding between health and the ministries of foreign affairs, which have to understand the relevance of all these activities. The work at the national level with UNCT and Manut, the opportunity of negotiation as clubs. This is a topic that is working. The people negotiating the United Nations assemblies in groups. These are the clubs. This uh, is something that is highlighted all the time, the scheme of negotiations with the African Union and the Euros on the other one. UNASU, there is really a scheme of clubs. And finally, we have to think about the life cycle of the priority for the region. How is it that we choose a topic in United Nations in the assembly at the WHO? This is an idea that whenever I present it, I try to improve it. Once we identify priorities, 
there is all the uh, uh, time for discussion, for agreement, and then there are common positions that are taken to the global forum. This global forum creates tools and mandates which must include recommendations and perspectives from our countries. That is why we play an important role. Then the strategies will become regional strategies, identifying good practices, and so on, and they will end up in a general plan. How does this side connect with that one and so on? Why is it important to go to the global forum to have a national plan being enforced? We have the framework of non-communicable diseases, for example. We were discussing very strongly, including or not, these tax tools as possible tools or recommended tools for the control of non-communicable diseases. We finally included them, and this has been very important for you to go to the ministers of health, talk to the ministers of economics, go to the parliaments and the commissions of health and say, look, the WHO is recommending the use of taxes to control uh, communicable diseases. This has created support uh, in the implementation of regulation of states, Uh, for example, the regulation of soft drinks in Mexico, that receiving support based on evidence, scientific evidence, and safety global trademarks, because the WHO recommendations are objective. And we have a number of tools. Yes, this is possible to be able to change some positions regarding uh, the debate, also at the level of countries. This is more or less the idea to start thinking and discussing in the forum on the pyramid. I invite you now to continue discussing. There are many things we have talked and we can discuss. Let's begin with these three. How the sectors involved in governance and health have changed. I would like to hear your examples from of different actions, experiences in the assembly, in the steering committee, at any meeting. Second, to share uh, those examples And third, in which, which is the benefit of a better position of, of the health agenda in the agenda of high level of the United Nations systems and in the working plans of other agencies and programs. How can I position the topics involving health in order to work better intersectorally and at the regional level? So... This is more or less uh, the content of this class. I hope to read your comments in this forum. Sorry, it was too long. And thank you very much again for your attention.